the umbrella name for the cabbage family, so cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli. It's easier to say brassica for me than to try to remember the laundry list. Um, the plants in my presentation uh, reflect my bias. They are not all the plants that you can plant in the garden all year. Your resource sheet has um, a link to this publication by NC State, and this will tell you everything that you can plant, transplant throughout the year and when best to do it. The last time I did this presentation, somebody asked me how big my farm was, because I seemed to grow so many things. In reality, I have three rather small community garden beds. So to grow vegetables all year and harvest them all year in North Carolina, you don't need a lot of space, you just need to know when to plant what and how to help Mother Nature extend your season. So having said that, um, the reason we can plant here in North Carolina all the time is because at the worst of times, the average temperature is just about freezing. And uh, that freeze usually doesn't last. It frequently comes early in the morning. And even if it does last for a couple days, we have some resources to help you do it. So for me, the gardening season begins in September. And my dates for the gardening season reflect the, the, reflect the time in which I plant my main crops. And you will see I have main crops and then I have sort of ancillary crops every season. So uh, first gardening season, the year begins in September, goes through February. Uh, the second season begins in February and goes through, through May, and this is the cool season. We move from the cold season to a time where the temperature moderates a little bit, and it's more or less cooler. And the third season is the warm season. This is when uh, most people start their gardening season, and for some people, it's the only season they garden in, which is sad. Uh, there are a few things you need. <laughs> there are a few things you need to think about um, in order to maximize your cool season garden, all your all season gardening. Uh, the first is whether to use transplants or seeds, and I, for every season, use a combination of both. Although I will tell you that my main crops are all transplants. Um, the seeds are just filling, because I can't uh, tolerate ground space. Um, this is especially important in the cold and cool season because of the colder weather and the shorter days. Um, I have tried to start brassicas in my house. You have to start them in July. They have requirements for cold and light, and you just get a bunch of leggy plants unless you're really, really good at it. It's so much easier to buy strong starts for the fall. Um, in the warm season, I, almost, I start almost everything from seeds because of the variety, as Sarah uh, said, and I, be, I become very picky in my old age. It's also easier to start the seeds in the spring. You start them in March. By the time April comes, the plants are growing. You can start putting them outside, hardening them off, and then you have a nice, strong plant in May. Um, whether you use seeds or transplants also depends upon the vegetable. Root crops, I have seen people try to start them in seed trays and move them to the garden. It's not worth the effort. They are root crops, they want to be in the ground, start them from seeds. Lettuce is one of the things I almost always start in a seed tray. Seeds are very small, they need moisture, they need light. Having said that, I have found the random bunch of seeds in a box in my car one day. I knew there were lettuce. November, I just threw them in the garden to see what would happen, and in the spring, I had a bumper crop. Uh, zucchini is a plant that just does better when it's planted in, directly in the ground. And spinach, you can either transplant or seed, but my mantra about spinach is that it loves to germinate in a hurricane. Likes hot soil, lots of water. So if there's a hurricane in August, that's the time to start your spinach seeds in a pot outside. That's how I do mine. Um, uh, we talked, uh, Sarah talked a little bit about days to harvest. From my perspective, um, the reason to know the days to harvest is how soon can I put something else in that spot? And uh, finally, uh, reiterating soil temperature. Uh, if your soil is cold and uh, really wet, your seeds are likely to rot. Even if they do spring up, they're never gonna be as strong as a seed that's planted in the right soil temperature. Another consideration is garden design. So this is my uh, very sophisticated design. I have a center row where my 
primary plants go, and then I have two shoulders, which I use as flex space. And the center has my longer growing crops, the flex space has things that are much shorter growing, or things like collards, which I pick leaf by leaf. And this is what my garden looks like. You can see that I think there are tomatoes in the, in the center. I have <coughs> string beans in the front over here. And then I have a fence uh, to support climbing plants. Um, another consideration in, in maximizing your three season is to interplant your uh, root crops in the center. So this is the garden this year. Oops, sorry, I always do that. Uh, go ahead. Um, I have my cabbage growing here. I have some lettuce um, that I grew from seeds as starts. And then I, here I have some beets. And you can put in herbs. So this is um, the cold season plan. Um, the center of the garden is brassicas um, the sh uh, along with some roots. And the shoulder is usually some hardy herbs or greens. Um, the more tender greens go into the center. The plan looks like this, and this is not an accurate representation of what my garden actually looks like. It is in terms of we have the brassicas here, we have the root vegetables, some lettuce, and some tender greens here. On the shoulder, there will usually be only one crop planted per shoulder but I do get two crops per shoulder every season. So one time it might be spinach, one time it might be bok choy. Um, this is an interesting diagram. I purchased a little garden planning program just so I could make these slides. And when I put in the picture for cabbages, it told me how much space each cabbage should have. And this is far more space than I allow in my garden. So I will have typically six cabbage plants. The timeline on cold season gardening is um, begins mid-August when I seed the little things I'm gonna interplant or plant on my shoulders. These would be leafy vegetables, lettuce, arugula. In mid-September, uh, no later than mid-September, I will transplant my brassicas. And I have a friend who grew up on a farm and he said, his daddy always said they should go in on Labor Day which is a good guide. Uh, for me, it's the minute they get into the garden centers. I'm on all their emails, so I track down in the middle of August this year. Um, at the same time I put my brassicas in, I will also put in some root vegetables, which you can't see here. And um, this is a story about interplanting. The um, pepper here just did not want to give up. It was, excuse me, eggplant. It was just producing and producing and producing. So what I did was leave that in, but interplant my brassicas and my cabbage here. And there's a story about that little brassica coming up. In the cold season, it's a question of repeat and add on. And this is where I start to add new plants to that main season crop. And this is kind of what it looks like. The center is basically the same, but I add snow peas in, at the end of January and I add cucumbers in the first week of April. Um, excuse me, the thing about cucumbers is they tend to go bitter in the heat, which is why I start them early so that I can harvest them because before it comes too, too hot. However, um, in doing this year after year, I have found some varieties that will not be bitter in the summer. And this year I had cucumbers in October. Um, so this is my, um, calendar for the cool season. Uh, this weekend, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna start my peas. I sprout them in paper towels in a, in a plastic bag in a warmish kind of place. Uh, the little tail over here is the root. And once I get a root, I throw them into dollar store trays. And they stay for about two weeks. And my goal is to plant them at the end of January. And in mid-February, uh, my, my uh, target is Valentine's Day. Usually that's when the stores have their next crop of brassicas. As soon as they're in the stores, I plant them along with some root vegetables. And by the time March comes, I'm seeding my cucumbers, and those cucumbers are transplanted in the garden in April for my first crop. Yes? You said you plant your peas by the end of January? 
I do. Mm -hmm. So if we get a no exemptions, they'll be fine um, as long as they haven't flowered. A frost will kill the flowers. And you could always just throw something over them if you have to. Yes? Um, when you say silver under seven foot ivy, you should not touch it. Is it the whole thigh or just the corners of the, the shoulder? Oh, the shoulder is, is the, um, the, whole, the whole side of each bed. shoulder right here um, and there's another one on the other side okay um, let's see if I get this big to get less um, another opportunity for expanding your cool season um, this is from 2019 there was a stretch of maybe 10 days that were 60s and 70 degrees I went out to my garden, I found a spot I knew I was not gonna put more brassicas in, threw in some carrot seeds, and this was my harvest in May. Then we get to the end of the gardening season for me, which is the warm season, but it is, in my opinion, the most glorious season of tomatoes and lettuce and peppers and squash. Um, this is what this garden looks like. My main crops again in the center and on the shoulder my um, transitory, transitory crop. Now, uh, one of the reasons I plant snow peas in January is because they do not like the hot weather. So by the time the warm season comes around, the snow peas have been pulled out, and I will typically put in beans, usually two kinds, a bush bean and a pole bean. The pole bean will take longer to produce, but it will produce longer. In the meantime, the bush bean is putting out um, Produce. And uh, cucumbers will continue into July. So uh, the warm timetable gardening, uh, early March, I start to see things. In mid-May, I transplant my main crops. And at the same time, I direct seed things like beans, zucchini, and basil. Now, the uh, warm season also expands. There's actually kind of a second part of the warm season. In late June and early July, I can transplant more cucumbers. I could reseed my beans and maybe change them up, put in some edamame instead of regular beans or put in some peas. And um, in early August, I can interplant among my uh, existing warm season plants. This is a snow peas of a gentleman in our garden. He planted the peas mid-August and he was harvesting them right before November. And the warm season expansion, uh, the, some things stay the same, all the main crops stay the same, but in between I will have planted some root crops and get them ready for the fall. I've changed these out, and now I've learned I could put in a second crop of cucumbers, although it could be anything you want. And before you know it, we're back to the new year. Yes? No, um, I'm going to show you that in a minute. It means plant, so you have your summer plants, and some of them you will have taken out because they're done. Some will remain, and you interplant between those that remain until they're ready to be pulled out of the garden. Okay, so how do we extend the garden? Well, in the cold season, it's really important, as I said, to get a head start with starts or with tra transplants. And that's because of the Persephone period that I learned about from my friend and fellow gardener, Sarah. The Persephone period uh, has a mythological reference, which, which I'm not going to go into, but it's the time of year where there are fewer than 10 hours per day of sunlight. And in Durham, North Carolina, that period is November 24th till Tuesday. <laughs> um, and what you need to know about that is that if you want to harvest during this period, your plants have to be 75% grown before November 24th. And you say, well, how do I know what 75% grown is? <clears throat> so if 100% grown is the days to harvest, we'll use broccoli as an example. It has a range of 50 to 60 days, we'll take it in the middle. 
we'll say that 75 days, 75% of 55 days is 41 days. So that plant will have had to be in the ground for 41 days if you want to harvest during this season. And if you subtract 41 days from November 24th, it means you need to plant on or about September 3rd. Going back to my friend's discussion about his daddy always said, cool weather plants need to be in by Labor Day. Questions on this? Hmm. And here's the discussion about interplanting. Um, this was an eggplant which just didn't want to give up the ghost, and there was my little cabbage plant, and certainly that plant did not do as well as the other plants which were not growing in the shadow of the eggplant. However, the plant is in the garden still, and it has extended my harvest until this time of year. Another way to extend the cold season is to snuggle your plants with row covers. Um, a row cover will keep your bed three to five degrees warmer at night. It will raise the temperature by 10 degrees during the day, and you'll be able to see a change in the soil within uh, five to 10 minutes. There are three weights of row covers, uh, a light summer weight, and this is great for the spring if you want to keep the cabbage moths off your plants. Uh, let, let's in 85% of the light, but will not offer you cold protection. The most common row cover is an all-purpose one. Let's in 70% of the light, um, protect your plants down to 26 degrees. And the toughest one is the heavyweight, but it cuts out 10% of light. You get only 60% light transmission, and it only gives you two more degrees of protection. So for me, that's not worth the time, effort, and money. Instead, I just double bag. I'll just go out to the garden if it's gonna be really freezing and throw another row cover over it. So in order to use row covers, you have to support them. This was my first for foray into support, it's PVC pipe. Um, I happened to have three beds, so we bought it in a roll and literally stretched it over our barbecue in the sun, so it got a nice arc shape. If you do use PVC pipe, it's important to know it's the kind that bends. I almost went to the scrap exchange and bought PVC pipe that didn't bend, or figured this out. Um, Here's another riff on the uh, PVC pipe, a little more architectural. And from experience now, I'll tell you that these are all too tall. You don't need that much height for a row cover. And uh, the standard row covers come in sizes, you know, six by 20, six by 50, that will not cover this all the way around. So what I use now, oh, and this is another issue about the PVC, it doesn't really offer you very good what I use now is this. I have not found it in Home Depot. I have found it in Lowe's. It uh, comes 10 feet long, so you will need bolt cutters. Uh, a wire cutter will not cut through it, or you could use a Dremel. We've used a Dremel. And it comes by a couple names, a remesh, eight by 10 foot steel wire mesh sheet, or masonry ladder. And if you Google under any of those things, it'll bring you to this. As you can see here, it offers much better support. Um, the gentleman on the right is using binder clips to hold the row cover on. The nice thing about this also is that it's thin enough that you can clip a binder clip on it. But with a PVC pipe, it's harder to do. I happen to use these uh, dollar store pins, and as you can see, they go on for on and on and on. Dollar store doesn't always have them, so whenever I'm in the dollar store, I go on a hunt. And the best thing I like about this row cover is that on a nice warm day, if you had your rows covered, you could just simply pull it over and roll it onto this little wire frame, tie it with a string or clip it on, and when the weather gets cold again, it's really easy to pull it over your bed. Um, these for fun are just some examples of other pre-made row covers. Um, to do a row cover, as I'm suggesting, is about $35 to $40. Dollars. The, wire has gone up from $3 four years ago to about $6 now, but this little baby cost $139 on the left. The one on the right is about $78, and it's really only good for legs as far as I can see. Um, I have used these little pre-made tubes for about four years, and I grow lettuce in them all year round. 
But my favorite fun um, idea is the dollar store clear umbrella for a small space or a container. And this is a testament to uh, row coverage. We had nine degrees on Christmas, and on January 1st, my lettuce was still in good shape, including the smallest little baby on the road. So extending the summer season really is all about cooling. Uh, one way to cool, cool your bed is to use some comp, excuse me, you're still on the, on the cool season. Uh, another way to warm the soil is by using compost. The dark color of the compost will draw the sun to it. But um, the real way to go, as far as I'm concerned, is to use plastic. It can increase your temperature by 10 degrees on a sunny day. Each day adds residual heat. There are many different kinds of plastic, and you don't have to be fancy about it. I have cut apart uh, garbage bags. Um, they each have different properties. Some will warm the soil more, some will protect against weeds. It looks like the green um, uh, row cover, row mulch um, is one of the best is as it warms the summer and blocks weeds. Um, one of the other options is this red infrared transmitting mulch. And the green and red are available in small quantities online. You just have to be prepared to pay enormous shipping fees. Um, but this will warm the soil, it will protect against um, insects, and there's a really good chance that it will increase the yields of your property by the way it reflects light back to the plant. If you are going to use plastic, um, you need to dampen the soil and ensure you have good contact, pat it down, make sure the plastic touches the soil, and um, you can further help your plants along by early in the season digging holes in the plastic and planting the plant in the hole so it gets the residual heat. Yeah? Um, the, the term you used, the row cover, now if you do a search on that, we'll find the row cover, like the fabric, yeah. at a Lowe's or Home Depot. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't actually found row covers at Lowe's or Home Depot's. Um, Stone Brothers Garden Center has them here, and then they're on Amazon all the time. Okay. So. Uh, this was a little experiment I did uh, this year to see really if there was a difference between the plastic and the dark. As of January 6th, there was no real difference, except that there was a total difference in that the soil temperature um, was raised by 20 degrees. And you don't need a fancy uh, soil thermometer. Uh, later, earlier this year, I upgraded my kitchen thermometer to a better uh, one that I could read. This is my old kitchen thermometer. Instant read, I just stick it in the soil to see what's going on. And for years, I will tell you, this uh, served as both my meat thermometer and my soil thermometer. <laughs> it's just a little quiet about that. <laughs> and this was my garden on January 1st. Um, the soil was warm enough that I could throw some turnips in, and then I used some of this um, mulch to heat up the soil and add some lettuce seeds, which I, which I had a spill, which spilled in and I just threw it in the ground. Um, you, these are some statistics from um, University of Alaska. Uh, when they use mulch, in the, uh, when they use plastic to warm the soil, cabbage and broccoli were seven to, day, to 10 days earlier. Zucchini was not only earlier, but there was an increase in production, and cucumber yields were up 8%, eight times. In, this, in, the, winter, in the summer, um, the goal is to cool things down. Soil temperatures over 85 degrees can be detrimental to your plants, and also tomatoes really won't flower after 80 degrees. So this is one way to do it. I think it's very elegant. It's not really... Um, Practical if you have a seven foot tall indeterminate tomato. Another way to do to cool your shade down is to add three or four inches of material to it. It could be leaves, it could be grass, it could be cardboard, and that could reduce your temperature by 10 degrees, but it will also provide additional benef benefits of reducing your need for watering, it'll protect against insects, and help you with soil-borne diseases. 
And this is my infamous uh, way I track my garden. Some would say it's akin to insanity. But for me, I want you to have everything on one sheet of paper. So um, the top part of it tells me a little bit about the vegetable, um, what, it, what its characteristics are, when it needs to be fertilized, and my comments. Um, how many days it took me to sprout, when I planted it, when I got my first flowers, when I did my first pick. I am some years very religious about this, other years not so much religious. Um, there is an easier way. Use your camera. So go into the garden, take a picture of what, what you planted, when you, and you have a time stamp on your camera that tells you what date it is, and you continue that throughout the year and have a visual reference rather than this kind of crazy one-sheet database. Um, and this is just to show put, uh, cucumbers planted in April. This is what they look like mid-May. And July 4th, I actually had two bushel barrels full of cucumbers in two weeks. Um, some of my veggie faves that um, I found over the years have been reliable for me. In terms of cucumbers, Tokiwa is a birthless Japanese cucumber. It's very sweet. It's delicious. The General Lee has been bred for the South, so therefore it will be more resistant to bitterness. I have, um, I'm only going to grow the Suyo Long for the first time this year, but I have a friend who grows it in Florida and says it holds up in Florida heat very, very well. For year-round lettuce, um, I love the mini romaine blend, and it's a perfect size for one or two people. Little Gem combines a soft lettuce with a core that's more like a romaine. And my favorite lettuce now of all time is the Segalane. It um, germinates very easily. It's very sweet. It looks beautiful. And more important is, is that it resists aphids. For summer lettuce, um, I like the crisps, Nevada and Muir. I have pictures of these growing in my garden in July. They don't come to a head, but they're very, very good lettuce. Um, in terms of zucchini, I've become a big fan of the eight ball. There's eight ball, cue ball, and one ball, uh, all different colors. And uh, the thing I like about this is they're small, you know, you're not eating zucchini for forever. You can take the inside out, mix it with some leftover chicken and some rice, throw in some cream of chicken soup, and then you have split it in half, and you have two meals in a bowl. Uh, we had a tough summer growing zucchini at Briggs last year. Uh, for some reason, and I spoke with Marcia who had the same experience, we had a lot of male flowers, which is great for fried zucchini flowers, but very few female flowers. So we didn't have a high production. But the one variety of zucchini that did very, very well was the cocazelle. And we kind of feel like that might be the only zucchini we plant in the garden this year. Um, I've never met an eggplant I didn't like, but two of my favorites are the Rosa Bianca. Uh, it's sweet, um, has very few seeds, but it's big enough that you could slice it to make it eggplant parmesan. I love Japanese eggplant, and one of the best producers i found is this called Shikao. Um, in doing this production, in do yeah, it's a production, isn't it? In doing this presentation, um, I did some research on what's new in the gardens this year. I'm certainly um, going to avail myself of the incredible escalator zucchini because it's a, instead of sprawling on the ground, this is going to grow up on one of my trellises. And it's supposed to be abundant, nutty, and delicious. What else could you want? Uh, I'm going to replace any black beauty with my black queen hybrid, which has fewer seeds, earlier maturity, and improved yield. Um, my new cucumber this year is going to be the early prince hybrid early maturity, strong disease resistance, and an increase in female flowers for more productivity. Um, broccoli, I'm really interested in what this stem broccoli, because you don't have to wait for it to come to a head. You don't have to buy six packs in a uh, plant store and, and have them all come in at the same time. Uh, apparently, you cut the center uh, stem, and then side shoots, eight to 10 side shoots develop. And because it doesn't have to wait to go to a head, you can 
use it in the warmer months where you're not worried about it bulking. And um, everything I read says that artwork is one of the best varieties of this. Tomatoes, everybody's favorite, and there's some new things on the market. Um, Pink Delicious Hybrid, it has the look and feel of an heirloom. Great disease resistance for the southeast, no cracking, and a high rating for sweetness. I have grown lemon boy yellow tomatoes for about five years when I, someone was kind enough to give me one from their garden. They're not the same as Carolina Gold, but they are delicious. And now the Plus Hybrid has absolutely unbelievable uh, disease resistance. And just about any disease you could think of a tomato, it's supposed to resist. I just couldn't resist the chocolate sprinkles because who doesn't want a delightfully sweet, disease-resistant, huge crop of cherry tomatoes? And just recently I found Jolene, which is a beef steak that will set in the heat when other tomatoes won't. And it also has a strong disease resistance for southern gardens. So just a few takeaways. Know what the best condition in terms of soil temperature and, and climate is for your plant. Interplant as long as you as much as you can for variety and length of harvest. Capitalize on breaks in the weather and throw some more seeds in. Uh, extend your season in both directions. Make the make them both last longer. And to the extent that you can, keep records. Questions? Yes. the extent that I can. Yeah. yeah. And then secondly, where in your cycle, if at all, do you turn soil and then soil at compost bins? So I, I used to do that uh, on a big time scale, turn the bed at the end of everything, but I've, I've come to learn it's not the best thing to do for your garden. So uh, typically, for instance, when I put in my shoulder crop, I will add some compost to that. I'll typically fertilize every plant as I put it in the ground. And then fertilize periodically throughout the summer. And that seems to be OK. Yeah. OK, so if you've got a garden pot, you've got the single wood frame that goes all the way around it, you would like to raise it and put in plant mail. If you've already got plants growing in there, can you still raise it? Sure. Okay. Sure. And as, you're, as you take your, as your plants mature and you take them out, just add more soil. Is that what you're saying? That's why I have to wait for the plant to do that. Yeah. Okay. That would be the thing to do. Yes. When you say fertilize, you fertilize, do you uh, do compost or do you do something else? So um, we're fortunate at Briggs that we have compost that we can use. So I do put new compost in my plant, at least on the top layer of every garden every year. And I use um, fertilizer appropriate for vegetables. Thank you very much.